Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and in each episode, I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? My guest for this episode was Dr. Lee from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Um, We talked about an area that's a little bit different in sociology that we don't normally talk about, and that is the sociology of food. Dr. Lee grew up in China. Um, She also then studied in America, in Michigan, studying sociology before returning back to China, where she she teaches on a range of different topics at the moment, including the really interesting area of the sociology of food. Without further ado, let's go over to the interview. Hi, thanks for taking the time to talk to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Um, My name is Xue Shi Li. Um, Currently, I'm a lecturer at CU Education Gen. I'm teaching like sociology classes here. Um, Before joining my current university, I was a postdoc um, uh, in Tsinghua University in China. And before that, I did my PhD at um, Michigan State University in the U.S., And my major uh, research area is sociology of food. And that's mainly about my area and my education background. And I'm very, um, like, appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak here. No, that's great. Thank you very much for for giving up your own time. Um, Before we get into sociology of food, which sounds absolutely fascinating, when you were studying yourself, what, what really inspired you in sociology? Was there any particular theories or sociologists that, that got you passionate? Um, I would say I was, um, when I started, um, I think it's really about my personal identity. Um, I grew up in Shenzhen, which is a, a migrant city in, uh, in China. And uh, when I was a high school student, most of my high, high school classmates, they were like, you know, um, they were eager to making a lot of uh, fortune in the future. However, I was fascinated when I was in high school about like different background of people. And then that's, I think, the major reason what got me into um, sociology for like college, which is a very weird and rare um, option for like, you know, for like students in my high school. So I guess if you have to say there is one uh, particular era which inspired me, that would be multicultural perspective, which I really uh, got a lot of um, good teacher in that era when I was studying uh, sociology in the in my university, which is like uh, the Central University for Nationalities, yeah. where there are like uh, 56 ethnic groups. Uh, student in that university, and I was major in sociology in that university. So I got a lot of uh, um, opportunity to um, other uh, culture and uh, different perspectives. And what what sort of different nationalities were you were you mixing with in your studies then? At that time, I really didn't quite understand. Like, um, um, you know, I was a Han, which is like the minor, uh, majority nationality in China, right? But when I was in um, the uh, my university um, for college, uh, like um, uh, we do have like uh, uh, like Hui, which is a Muslim right group in China, and I do have roommates who did not have the same um, living habit like myself. Like for example, they didn't eat. Mm, pork and uh, also I have um, classmates they spoke a different uh, language so when they were uh, in college speaking Mandarin Chinese they didn't feel very comfortable and all that and uh, um, one of the things I think in my um, undergraduate program is that I start to know there's many different way of like saying the word like like the classmates I just mentioned, um, 
I feel like um, at first I thought, you know, this that's because maybe that's they are not from a very very economic developed area. I was kind of uh, you know uh, even I question like Shenzhen like all these kind of. Uh, too much about this business um, idea. But when I was in my college um, with the other students from other um, background, I was um, at first very not, like not very used to that. Yeah. However, I think um, in the four years, I do get a lot of like ethnography opportunities in the program. Uh, all that experience really helped me to like say things differently. Especially, uh, I think that's 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 is quite helpful. Yeah, and where, whereabouts in the states did you say you were studying? Uh, I was in Michigan, uh, which is like um, our uh, my my university is in East Lansing, which is the capital of Michigan, and uh, it is an agriculture um, era in the states. Yeah. Okay. And uh, especially since like uh, the Detroit wasn't doing very well at that time, I was studying there, and there's a lot of uh, um, uh, reflection about you know the economy and all that uh, in the states, and uh, um, that's actually the reason why I like I changed my era from environment to um, food. And what what did you find were the biggest challenges? going to America from, from your own background? Well, the challenging is, again, you have to change your perspective, right? Yeah. Even though I thought I was really ready um, because I think, I thought I, you know, I was uh, very uh, used to ethnography. I mean, used to, you know, say things from a very different culture, but I didn't realize that even that was true. In China, I was still, a relative privileged group. I mean, I was from the urban Shenzhen, and you know, even I was in the um, ethnic group. I was, um, I was, uh, you know, I was like a Han nationality. But when I was in the U.S., that's I think that's the first time when I was studying sociology. I feel like I became this third world developing country yeah. students, and I couldn't speak very well and. Um, you know that kind of change in perspective is something I I didn't expect it uh, since like a uh, sociology food there's a lot of uh, um, things about food which is quite local and some of the classes I took um, the the instructors they have never you know been to China yeah. it's very hard to, for them to teach somebody who from a developing country. Um, they think, you know, maybe you were very familiar with food because you are from like uh, this developing country. But I was from urban Europe, you know, yeah. in China. So uh, there's a lot of difficulty in terms of uh, the differences. And uh, especially, it's not only differences, it's like you become not the privileged group um, yeah. in terms of perspective. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. And I, I wondered how you found sociology because I, I teach international students myself. I teach a large number of Chinese students, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things they often say is about the, the sociology they often learn about is very westernized. The writers tend to be English or French or American, but certainly from the Western world. Did, did you find that as well in your own studies? Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, that, that's why I said the challenge is you start to learn about a lot of these social problems, but in a perspective of the U.S., right? Yeah. Um, and they would say there's a huge like food security problem in Detroit, and you were like scratching your head. You were like a lot of people in China they were starving as well. But yeah, it, yeah it's like a bad thing. Both thing. The, both the theory and the empirical case are very social context based. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually used to teach in Kenya as well. And quite often I'll be presenting ideas on poverty or what poverty meant in Britain. Now, of course, poverty in Britain compared to poverty in Kenya is two, exactly. very, different, two very different things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so let's move on to your, your own research. And as you said, one of your major areas is the sociology of food. 
which is a little bit different to anything we've looked at so far. So would you like to start by telling us a little bit about that research? Um, so as I said, I had a lot of time with you know, struggling uh, when I'm trying to uh, get the US perspective of sociology. But I do find like my instructor, he was a um, theorist and he um, also, he was a visiting professor in University of Edinburgh, right? Yeah. So he has this transition was like a continental um, approach into sociology, which means I do learn a lot of like a theory from him. And one of the um, particular school we were in is like a sociology of knowledge as well as um, RNT, uh, actor networking theory, which is like uh, based on the French uh, Latour's um, theory, right? Yeah. And um, since I do have a lot of uh, uh, experience when I was in um, uh, Michigan, I did learn a lot about food. Um, it, yeah, that's something I, 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 I um, you know, because of the uh, location, I start to uh, develop interest. So in my, for my dissertation, I say, well, why not I, I use a theory to study uh, sa same kind of like a case I was used to here in the United States. At that time, I was very used to like community agriculture and so on. So I went back to Beijing, did my field work. I used the same theory, but in the Chinese content to study the um, counterparts of the community agriculture uh, organization in China, in Beijing, uh, the, the suburb uh, era. And um, I did a little bit of um, compare, uh, uh, I did a little bit of comparison with the case I learned about in, the, in Michigan. Um, and I have some interesting discovery and um, I, basically write my dissertation on that topic. And then after graduation, I did a little bit of program for FAO uh, about China's um, alternative food network. Um, so again, I'm using the same theory, but in a very different um, content, right? A context, the social context of China, because to the US community uh, is one thing, but in China is another thing. And uh, even you are studying food, again, you need to, you know, adapt to a different uh, environment. Uh, even the environment is what I was used to um, in terms of my nationality. But um, I did the research. I found that uh, in China, actually, the uh, community support agriculture was here, not, on, not like the same reason as it, how it was developed in the U.S., in terms of for China's food safety problem and uh, um, all that, a major reason rather than the U.S. Uh, is really about like social movement, about community and um, that. So uh, that's my uh, study uh, like uh, for the food part. And after I start uh, here um, teaching my school, um, again, I was using the theory and trying to study people nearby. We, like basically, I'm uh, I'm trying to look through food about the people and the groups and uh, other things um, reflecting through food. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you're interested in both the production of food and the community side around it as well. Is that right? Um, yeah, for the community um, service part, uh, it's very interesting. In, uh, actually, in Beijing, that is like a one. Both the consumers and the producers, they are like uh, the same group, yeah. which means it's, yeah. But here, down in Shenzhen, mm, yeah, uh, we mainly study the consumption side because it's hard to study the production side. It's too urbanized, basically, yeah. here in Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about the, the consumption of food. How do you, how do you add a sociological uh, theory to, to something about the consumption of food? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, in sociology, our, um, like one thing we study is about structure and agency, right? So um, that's the always big. And um, I think in the consumption side, in terms of food consumption, a lot of the, um, time the food study people 
especially if you look at the um, um, literature in the States, you will see a lot of time uh, the study were focused about food consumption with, in terms of agency or like uh, in terms of people's choices, right? Um, but when I was studying here, um, sometimes when we look at the consumption, we want to look at how the structure, especially in the Chinese content, right? The structure is like a, a very important aspect, how st social structure influences food, um, like uh, the way how food was presented to people and how the structure behind the industry uh, influence people work in the industry and how that uh, influences choices people can have um, with food. For example, like uh, in addition to the, this pro, uh, project, I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, I did a research on um, Food Street in Shenzhen, which actually I got that uh, um, presented in British um, Sociological Annual oh, Meeting, yeah. right? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it is uh, interesting because actually a lot of people think, oh, you know, if you are going to consume food, it's like our choices and we can, um, you know, if we want to form community, we want to consume diverse of food. Um, it's really cons consumers' uh, choices. But if you look at the uh, a third study I did uh, for the, Food Street, you will notice that actually how Shenzhen was changing, especially the gentrification process, yeah. and all that influenced Food Street, right? And uh, when the Food Street was influenced by the, uh, the housing price, the development of the city, and the group um, who were able to run the restaurant there, there's not many choices for consumers to pick because um, for example, in order um, for the uh, food restaurants in the street to earn profits, they need to make money quickly. Otherwise, you know, the food street is just not uh, efficient enough in terms of um, the housing price, right? So there are uh, like five lobster uh, restaurants, uh -huh. you know, together on the food yeah. street. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, as a, a consumer, you can choose. Say, you know, we want this kind of uh, um, lobster rather than that kind. But that's all you have got. So basically, uh, through that study, um, it reflects how food and also how restaurants, how food choices, are influenced by the history, by the uh, uh, gentrification, and about the. All the all these kind of structure um, forces behind the food yeah. influence people's choices and include but, influence what we put in our body in our mouth every day. That's yeah, that's that's the thing. So you do quite a lot of um, attachment to social class as well. Well, um, I mean, um, that's a very interesting question. I mean. We do say about gentrification, but on the other hand, I, yeah, I mean, because of the um, the political environment, how I'm teaching sociology right now, right? So you can see that through the story about the class. Yeah. But um, I don't make like uh, arguments of like class and the political, um, you know, implication of class. Yeah. yeah. And what about the changing nature of food, because it would be fair to say that we're becoming, we have become much more aware about diet and health and protein and so on. So how have you seen that's, that's changed our um, relationship um, with food? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's very interesting you mentioned that. Um, one thing, uh, while I was teaching this class, I, I do have this chapter on health and food. Um, and usually um, the literature, you know, on, in that area was um, in the U.S. is more about like how people, you know, um, are changing their uh, diets. Again, in China, because China is in this uh, very state, a stage of everybody in the city was trying to, um, you know, earn as much, <laughs> much uh, salary as possible so they can buy a house, something there. Yeah, they are not worried about that. Right, right. So um, a lot of time, if you, for example, if I've studied 
I'm studying how um, the players who are influence people's choices in making a health or um, healthy diets. Actually, because people don't make that kind of choices consciously. Yeah. Uh, it is sometimes the industry behind it. For example, the deliver uh, company, the uh, food street, and all that makes the choice for people. Yeah. Um, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's interesting. So it comes down to kind of priorities as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, it's fun. Like, uh, I saw, like, uh, in the U.S., a lot of these um, literatures using Foucault to study how people governing their body. Um, here, you really, I mean, um, I think I'm, I, yeah, I'm looking at the consumption, but also I'm looking at how this consumption is related in terms of food company and, like, the provider side even though they are not production side, right? Yeah. Um, like uh, I do have another student, he did a research on deliver guys, um, you know, the food deliver person. Yeah. And he um, was outside for two months deliver food for, uh, for people. And um, he was saying actually um, today, you know, a lot of people make their choices uh, because of this, uh, how this food deliver company influenced their choices. That's really interesting. So do you look at also the, the kind of how food is marketed and advertised as well then? Yeah, there was one um, article I was written last, uh, I was writing about last year is about this, um, how this um, magazine called LOHAS, which is stands for Lifestyle of uh, Sustainability and Health. Okay, LOHAS. I don't know whether you use that term in UK. Uh, no, I haven't heard that, no. Uh, I think that term originally come from uh, Boulder, US, okay? okay, which is like a really, really hippie um, town. Um, so um, there was actually a magazine called Lohas in China, okay? So I did say how this magazine frame what they called sustainable and healthy food, right? I studied the frames they apply to in the magazine and i noticed that a lot of these frames are uh, really um you know focus on personal health rather than sustainability um i guess but i didn't like that article wasn't uh, is it has not been finished yet so i really can't tell you more about that so t- tell us some more. What else have you have you found or do you teach about in relation to sociology of food? Um, so in terms of uh, that question, okay, because now I spend a lot of time teaching, right? So uh, during my teaching time, sometimes I would collect some kind of like a ethnographic, uh, ethnographic case about people, especially uh, people work in the food industry uh, here in Shenzhen, the migrant workers, right? Um, I kind of want to say through how their personal story may influences also about the food um, we consume yeah. every day. Yeah. Um, because in, in some sense, um, uh, today China is like a, on, at this stage where the food system is fastly industrialized, right? you can barely see like agency of individual actors have in the food system. Um, If you look at the uh, literature and all that, Um, but I guess in that aspect, I'm a a very um, symbolic interactionist uh, approach person, right? I want to say whether there is is really the case. I mean, I, I understand because of the time, the industrialization and all that, influences the food we consume but what about in a micro level in the interaction level yeah. um whether these migrant lives how would that affect the, the food especially how they um you know they prepare food for uh others i mean but um that is just like a pet project because yeah. 
Uh, I do under I do think uh, it is true that the, those big bigger players like food delivery companies or or like um, the food street uh, or that restaurants or like uh, the chains um, they are bigger players and they do influence a lot of our choices. Well, you know, on the on the consumer side, on the food worker side, you don't have that much agency. Yeah. But I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I hope that's why I'm collecting these ethnography cases, hopefully to see um, maybe in the daily life, you know, there is some kind of agency for us. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, I, I noticed that in the sociology of food, it's like a very popular era in the U.S., yeah. right? Um, there's a lot of food studies um, in the U.S. lately. But in China, it's not like, uh, you know, like my students, they are middle class, but they are not really paying a lot of attention to what they put in their body or p food consumption. Like um, I have a homework for them, like uh, each semester, ask them to submit um, the snack they like, right? Yeah. And when I look at all their snack, okay, all the snacks they submit to me, this is like, like typical jump. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's like junk food, right? Yeah. And I was wondering, like, whether Badiou's theory really applied to Chinese case. Because if you think about Badiou, Badiou always say, you know, because there's a big difference of classes, right? And yeah. I do see that in the States. Like, you know, like Badiou's theory about um, how different class would have different food adequate and that food yeah. consumption. Uh, but for it's it's really yeah that's a very interesting um thing like I noticed my students no matter what kind of background they were um they consume like um, junk food like um, yeah. I I guess that's maybe that's the the, the 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 stage I was talking about about the um industrialization is really affecting the food sector so mm -hmm. at this point you know any kind of industrialized food was considered to be better than maybe you know some kind of unprocessed food on the street yeah maybe yeah. that's uh, the, the the case uh -huh. and do you think they're consuming it simply because of practicality that it's it's quick it's easy it's relatively cheap but my students were middle class. I mean, they yeah. were. They should be the person like uh, in the U.S. They would be like the person who are, uh, you know, shopping at a farmers market or yeah. like a uh, Whole Food. Uh, yeah. You know, they were. They are like the 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 the, the, the student who are like uh, who who are also at the age where they care a lot about you know their body figures, yeah. like how many yeah, like they, but they did they don't. Um, yeah, like, I don't know. I think that's that's really interesting in terms of, like, you can't say any kind of, uh, like, uh, how family background affects their choices in terms of that. Yeah. But you do say, like, how they consume, for example, on um, clothes brand, like, brands of clothes, laptop differently, right? But in terms of food, there's not, like, significant difference among uh, different background of students. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Lee, where, where can we find more information about your research or do you have a, a Twitter account or a blog or anything else that students can find out a little bit more about your work? Um, I do have like um, articles published on the Six Tune, which is like um, a medium, um, like a public medium, um, like account. Yeah. Maybe I can send you the link. And there's uh, the student can also find other um, sociologists um, who st uh, like studying in food in China, which is interesting to me because the one thing I didn't touch is food culture. Um, because, you know, in terms of sociology, we don't study that. But there's other scholars study like um, social issues and they're using a culture um, lens. Maybe that would be interesting to some of the, uh, the students there. Yeah. And you're also going to send me a video, which I'll, I'll tweet out for you as well, right? Yeah, uh, the video talks about the life of uh, Sister Gods. I think... I, I really like the project we did because sometimes I think for sociology, as I mentioned, right, 
we want to um, change people's perspective. We want to stand for uh, like another, especially as social actors we are not familiar with. We want to stand in their shoes to look at the city, look at the society. And uh, I think I really like the project the student did for the uh, food deliver um, company and all on uh, like food deliver topic and also this video I'm going to send to you because both video talks about food preparation um, and how these people who are doing this was actually seeing the both the things they are doing about this and also about um, their relation with the food with the city. Yeah. Um, while I was showing that to my student here, because they are middle class kids, um, sometimes they said, wow, I never thought that way. Um, because I thought food was just food. I, you know, I never thought about people behind the food and all that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, I look forward to, look forward to seeing that one. Thank you very much for giving up your, your time today. And um, uh, best wishes for, for the future and with your students and for future teaching as well. Okay, thank you um, a lot for giving me this time to communicate. And I do want to say that because of this event, I didn't teach for a long time. So if my English is confusing, um, I'm sorry for that. Um, no, 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 yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com.